welcome to the Interview with the Experts podcast series. My name is Alan Lewis, and I'm the co-director of the Pericardial Clinic here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. It's my pleasure uh, today to be joined by our colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin Greeson, who's one of our cardiac surgeons with a real expertise in pericardial disease. In fact, Kevin does the bulk of our patients with pericardectomy, and so it's my pleasure to be joined by him today. We're going to be speaking today about surgical considerations of pericardectomy in patients with constricted pericarditis. Thank you very much for joining us today, Kevin. Oh, great. Glad to be here, Alan. Thank you for having me. I thought, Kevin, maybe we will start with speaking about when should we be doing pericardectomy and when is pericardectomy indicated? For the patients that have constriction, I think... um, Operation is really the only definitive treatment. Um, there is a differentiation between patients that may have constrictive physiology after a heart operation. We would give them some time to get better, but I think if you have a truly bona fide diagnosis of constriction, you should start thinking about operation. That makes complete sense. You're absolutely right that the only real fix is, is being able to remove the pericardium in someone with fibrous pericardectomy. I was wondering if you could just walk us through the different kinds of pericardectomy out there, the different surgical approaches, and what do you do? So that's a great question because there's a lot of controversy in how to do a pericardiectomy. Um, a lot of people will remove just the anterior, anterior pericardium from phrenic nerve to phrenic nerve and from the great vessels to the diaphragm. That's what we call an anterior pericardiectomy. But that leaves a very large area of pericardium on the diaphragm and posterior to the left phrenic nerve that can also result in constriction. Uh, My take on pericardiectomy is to remove as much pericardium as is safely possible. Um, Having said that, uh, when dealing with constriction, it's imperative that you decorticate the right and left ventricles. So that's from AV groove to AV groove. Um, If there is super dense uh, calcification growing into the heart in the AV groove, I'll leave that behind. But short of that, I try to take as much of the pericardium as I safely can. And uh, Kevin, is this an off-pump procedure or an on-pump procedure? What do you typically do and how do you decide? So it often starts as an off-pump procedure, but to really remove the pericardium off of the diaphragm and posterior to the left phrenic nerve, you have to elevate the heart up quite a bit. And the heart doesn't really tolerate that unless you're on cardiopulmonary bypass. So I usually make a decision within the first five minutes of the pericardiectomy, how this is going to go. If I can free up the heart from the pericardium all the way back to the pulmonary veins, um, then I probably could do it off bypass. But short of being able to do that, and I would say that in the majority of cases, you cannot do that. I go on bypass. It's much safer for the patient. Um, It's a much more relaxed procedure. And I think it's probably a much more effective procedure because it really allows you to get the pericardium behind that left phrenic nerve and off the diaphragm all the way down towards the IVC. That sounds great. I know most people are fearful of going on bypass in this group of patients, but as you indicated in your experience, you found this to be safer and more effective. Is that right? That's correct. We'll see these patients in the operating room with a right atrial pressure of 30. And when we go on cardiopulmonary bypass, we drain all that blood off. Uh, We do the pericardiectomy, and then we come off bypass and give back the blood they need. But oftentimes, we'll have two liters of blood in the venous reservoir after uh, coming off cardiopulmonary bypass. So this is just extra blood volume that the patients are carrying around. And with that blood being off, their hemodynamics are much better, and we can send that blood to the uh, cell saver and uh, make pack red cells for us uh, in the future if we need them. But um, you know, patients usually do better with a CVP of 10 versus 30. Makes complete sense. Just to ask, Kevin, you know, these are patients that are at a higher risk in the operation. Constriction operations aren't necessarily always easy. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about complications related to this procedure? What happens? What should we be watching out for and things like that? Well, I think probably the first complication to avoid is an inadequate pericardiectomy. 
So you have to make the decision that if you're going to the operating room, you're going to do everything that you need to do to affect a good operation. And in my opinion, that usually includes going on cardiopulmonary bypass, but can also include cross-clamping the aorta. Uh, if you have densely scarred uh, heart to the pericardium, it's much easier to separate the two with the heart arrested uh, and the heart soft and flaccid. So usually it takes about 20 minutes of cross-clamp time to completely free the heart all the way back to the pulmonary veins. And that's what the patient needs. So that's where I start in my complication avoidance uh, scheme. But as far as postoperative complications, probably the most common one we see is postoperative atrial fibrillation, which is very common to any uh, open heart surgery procedure. Uh, for standard coronary bypass operation or a valve replacement or repair, our prevalence of atrial fibrillation is probably 30 to 50%. But with pericardiectomy, it's actually less than that. In our 20-year series that we reported, it was like 13%. So that would be probably the most common complication of surgery. And following that would be a prolonged intubation. A lot of these patients are quite sick with their heart failure and their constriction. And it takes a while for the heart to kind of get its mojo back and uh, get back to a well-functioning organ. And that can result in several days of intubation. Then we have the usual suspects of uh, bleeding, maybe 3%, kidney failure, 2 or 3%, uh, return to the operating for uh, bleeding, maybe 2%, stroke is uncommon, 1%. So those complications are low. Um, but I would tell a patient the chance of major badness is probably on the order of 5 to 10%. That sounds very reasonable there. And then... I guess people and patients often wonder what happens after their pericardectomy. Do you mind running us through that? That's a nice. That's a good question because patients will often say, "Can I live without my pericardium?" And my answer to that is, "You will live a lot better without your pericardium." <laughs> so uh, the pericardium uh, in this situation, it's a, a detriment to the patient. And by removing it, hopefully we can relieve their heart failure, and then they'll return to a normal uh, uh, life um, expectancy and uh, quality of life without the heart failure. Um, you know, many of these patients have had constriction and heart failure for several years by the time they come into operation. And the heart is not going to bounce back right away. But in due time, I would say usually within a month or two, they should notice a considerable improvement in their heart failure symptoms and how they feel. And I think that uh, six months after operation, they're probably back to feeling quite normal. Kind of a humorous story in that regard in that um, sometimes we'll see patients six to eight months after the pericardiectomy. We won't even recognize them because they've lost all the heart failure, uh, fluid, edema, things of that nature. That's fantastic. You know, this really does make quite a big difference to the patients, and you, you're absolutely right. You see them, and they're a completely new person, and they've got their quality of life restored and things like that, especially if you catch this early and don't delay your operation. So that that's that's absolutely wonderful. That's a great point. I think the earlier we intervene on constriction, the better. It's quite satisfying to see a patient lose 40 pounds of water in the hospital such that their clothes don't even fit when they go home. They're really happy in that regard. That's great. Someone has to bring them a new wardrobe is what you forgot <laughs> to mention after after pericardectomy. So or, or punch a few holes in their belt, you know. <laughs> them, so well, Kevin, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us uh, and for all your input and expertise here on the surgical management of constricted pericarditis. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Alan. Have a good day. <laughs>